Hey, everybody, this is Charles Dobbins, the founder of the Multifamily Investing Academy and the co the host of the Multifamily Investing Academy podcast. And uh, I'm here with uh, with uh, Tom Higgins of um, Terra Capital. We're going to get into him in just a minute, but, but I got to toot my horn uh, here a little bit, Tom. Just so you know, you are now being interviewed on the the podcast that was voted best podcast by the the uh, American Apartment Owners Association magazine for 2022. Yeah, yeah, you're. Yeah, I know what you're nodding your head. I am very nice. Huge. I am pretty huge, Tom. And uh, <laughs> you know, finally, finally, I get the get the props that I have been deserving since first grade. And now I'm, now I'm, uh, now I am somebody. So uh, welcome aboard. Well, thank you for having me on uh, your podcast. I've been listening to it for a while now. And I think it's uh, valuable for both, you know, all levels of real estate investors. So I've really enjoyed the content. And I was wondering if I should call you Mr. Wonderful during our, uh, no, our podcast today. Not that guy. No, not that guy. No, please don't. Please okay. Don't. <laughs> Um, hey, listen. Okay, so the name of your company is Terra Capital. Um, you kind of, you know, I, I like how you we're on a mission to terraform prime assets. Nice little, nice little play on words there. They're very clever, mm -hmm. very clever. Um, now, your office. Before I get into the real nitty gritty, your office is says Fifth Avenue, New York City, city. But nobody's there anymore, right? We're here. We're here. No, you're not. Come we're on, here. you don't walk down that street every you day. See, you can see it outside. It still exists. I've got the same background, uh, you know, in my in my uh, Zoom library too. Everybody can have that one. No, <laughs> really, you do. You go to work, and, and, and we do. People are back. There's life in New York, you know. Jeez, there's know. life. I wouldn't want to own office buildings in new york but there's life no kidding, no kidding. there's like gosh it's dying. so where do you live though i live on the upper east side of manhattan with my wife and three and a half month old baby oh congratulations good for you you, you know what the, you know what the problem is with kids what they grow up well yeah, right now i i'm waking up you know all hours of the night holding a little baby and enjoying it so <laughs> that's good for you man now where are you from because you're not from so born and raised in new york city my whole life wow grew up on the upper east side went to elementary school there went to high school here went to college here which um, college i went to columbia okay because you couldn't get into nyu i understand exactly, right? or, or boston college i get it i, I wasn't i wasn't cool enough for nyu That's i know I oh you want to know how to find out uh, somebody uh, went to NYU. Just wait five minutes and they'll tell you. Because <laughs> my, because my son reminds me all the time. Yeah, I went to NYU. Like, yeah, I know, I paid the bill. It was the most expensive college in the world. And uh, you know, he's yeah, he's, exactly. yeah he's I think it is. It may actually be the most expensive. In no, the world. it is. It is. I I checked it out. I checked it out. And they have this um they have this uh satellite university in Shanghai that's I've like. Eight thousand dollars, and I said, "Why can't you go there?" I mean, so you didn't you didn't do what your father did and force him to go to Boston College? <laughs> no, no. Uh, oh, this, okay, that right away I know you listen. So if you if you listen, you got to say hello to my number one uh, listener, my brother Lenny. You're gonna say hi to my brother Lenny? I can't. I don't see Lenny. Oh, he's, the in, he's in the um, he's in his lab. Uh, you know, uh, working on tsetse flies right now, and he is. I'm not kidding you. That's where he listens to me. It's when he's when he's working in his lab. Well, so, Lenny, I'll try not to bore you today. You, no, no, no. I like what you're doing. Uh, you know, let's talk about Terraformer. It's uh, they are on a mission to to uh, um, terraform prime assets across the U.S., bringing new life to properties in neighborhoods where people actually want to live and work. Okay, now, now when I'm reading this. Right away, my mind is going as to where, what, where is he talking? Um, the the inf what they do is their information is rooted in data, so they look at markets with the demonstrable long term growth. So one thing I want to talk to you about is what type of data do you look at? Where do you get that data? What because I'm always fascinated by these demographic guys, how they yeah. can look at data and it speaks to them in a particular way. Um, you're raised in construction. They, you prior to prioritize value add and distressed assets, of course, because we're investors. That's what we do. Uh, we don't go looking for the class A in the, in the emerging markets. Um, and you're trained in private equity. 
Uh, we capitalize on portfolio exit strategies. So what you've done is you've taken the three components of this business that, that make someone successful and you've tied it all together in one company. And uh, and the name of the company is, uh, oh, come on, where are you? Is it Terra, where, Terra Capital? TerraCapital.com, right? You Or USATerra.com. Yes, sir. Okay. Welcome. So let's... Let's talk about this. So your background is in private equity. Is that where you got your start? Yeah, so let me let me give you my background quickly. So yeah. I am the real estate developer operator of our company. Okay. I right out of college, right out of Columbia, I went and worked for one of the largest private development companies in New York City doing ground up and adaptive reuse. Okay. Um, so I was a development manager, sourcing land, running projects on site every day, doing construction management. Yeah. So I did that for a number of years. My most notable project was 70 Pine, which is the adaptive reuse of a million square foot skyscraper in the financial district. So, you know, it was the job that no one wanted to go to that I got thrown into uh, with very, very few tools in our tool belt, but we were able to complete the project. We gutted Class C office, brought it to Class A rental, 777 units. Um, after leaving Rose, I wanted to get a more national exposure, more national experience, kind of go to as buttoned up of a shop as I could go to. So I went and worked for the Lennar Corporation. And for Lennar, I worked for their wholly owned subsidiary called LMC. At LMC, I did ground up development in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. And we built everything from like 180 unit jewel box, luxury rental building to 800 unit skyscrapers. Um, so. Wow. Okay. Then, then you are grossly overqualified for what I think you're doing right now. I, well, yeah, so, it, you know, it's interesting. I absolutely love real estate development. I love institutional level development, yeah. but I think it's all about doing it at the right time. So it's not that I'm not using those skills or not, or kind of leaving them behind. I think we have to look at the markets and look at real estate development generally as a timing equation. And so right now is the right time for Terra strategy. And we can go into that if you want. Or yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. But before we do, what, why is it, why is now not the right time for development? Well, I mean, I, I was sitting around the table with people from Brookfield and related like last week and everyone's saying, oh, we have to build to a six and a half cap. I'm like, okay, show me a deal where you actually can build to a six and a half. It just doesn't exist. The relationship between rents, land prices and construction costs don't go to a 6.5 cap. They just yeah. don't. So yeah. it, it's a timing thing. And I've saw it for years, you know, I was in the, in the space offering on land, anything from garden style in, outside of Philly to, um, you know, mid rise in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the margins were so tight. And I was working at a company that probably had one of the lowest cost of capital in the United States. So from my standpoint, it's like, let's not force the issue here. Like let's come up with a way to capitalize on our current environment. And like, let's zoom out and see, you know, how can we, prepare ourselves to best execute in the next five, 10 years we have ahead of us. Okay. So the, even those really smart guys you were sitting around the table with, and they're talking about building to a six and a half cap, are, are they, you know, is their view myopic and just no deals are happening. New York City, like, you know, the, the most expensive places, or are they looking outside of those markets? Everywhere. I mean, look, I think Garden, people get more adventurous. Garden deals, work, workforce housing, right? Like yeah. capital markets love workforce housing. Yeah. I looked at some great workforce housing deals. They're uphill battles. They, they're good deals if you can get them done. There's just a lot to find a site where you can hit economies of scale. And that's 200 units, 180 to 220 units for, for garden style type development. It's difficult. They exist, you know, um, but the capital market started pulling back. Debt started getting more expensive. Construction pricing was going. And yes, rents were going up. But is that sustainable rent? What percent of AMI is that? You know, for us, we need to be below 25% for our company. You know, um, annual rent needs to be below 25% AMI. And we weren't seeing that. You know, the rent we needed to demand didn't have the correct relationship with with um, the area of mean income. So it started very quickly slipping from workforce housing to now we're doing garden development again. 
and yeah. and we're kind of squinting to hit those high sixes. Deals get done. Don't get me wrong. I just not in my neck of the woods um, as much as I would like. And I just felt like people were kind of chasing um, not really great opportunities in the development space. And I didn't want to go out and create a development company to lose all our investors' money. So okay, all right. So great, excellent explanation here. So then you come along and you say, all right, if this is now what I've been doing for the last couple of years is not the next going to be the next 10 years for me because of all the changes that's, that are happening, where does the opportunity lie? And what did you come up with? Yeah, so I think it's been screaming us in the face for a long time. And, and we're not the first people to, to do this strategy. It's been done very successfully before. It's been done unsuccessfully before. But I like to think about it as we're going after the properties that are too big for flippers and too small for developers or syndicators. Our sweet spot is eight unit multifamily deals where anywhere from 30 to 50% of the total development cost is in uh, value add. Okay, so wait, my, did, you, did you say eight units? units? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? That's our sweet spot. Really? 100%. Wow. Okay, so listen, there's a guy, Aaron Merriman, who I think he was on one of my, my original podcasts, and we had him speak at a conference. And Aaron Merriman, his sweet spot is just like where you are in LA. And the guy is killing it. Absolutely killing it. For just the reasons you said, it it falls within this gray area within the market. Hundred percent. Very okay. So, okay. so people talk about institutional buyers, right? They say four percent of all the properties that are single family homes that are acquired are by institutional buyers, and there's theoretically a single family roll up strategy that people really love. And then you have all the hundred plus unit buildings being bought by institutional buyers, I mean, probably 150 plus realistically. Right. Right. And then you have syndicators that are willing to do like a 50 unit plus deal. Maybe some like new syndicators are like, okay, I'll do a 25 unit deal or something yeah. like that, right? So there's buyers on these bookends, but we see a, just a void in the middle, right? Yeah. From two to 15 units that require a lot of value add, 1920s, 1890s properties, people don't know what to do with, do with it. And like I came out of school, out of university and went right into renovating 19, you know, 10 skyscrapers and, and, the Southern District of Manhattan. So for me, it was like natural to, to be willing to take on um, a kind of a more intensive renovation process than a lot of our competitors. And we built a great team around that strategy. Okay, now uh, we're gonna come in for a big circle here, but we've got to talk about your markets. I've gone through your website. You know, you're looking, what I see here is Columbus, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, Sir. secondary markets. Um, okay. So let's talk demographics. Let's, let's talk uh, statistics. Why do you like those markets for these eight unit opportunities? So first is not everyone's chasing the news in those markets. So, you know, this type of roll-up strategy, four units, five units, eight units in certain areas of Florida and Miami are still going to be over competed or, or kind of too many people are going to be going after them because anyone that wants to invest in real estate is trying to chase any sort of deal they can do there. So it, your yields are going to get compressed, your cap rates are going to get compressed. The Midwest, from our experience, is there's much less competition in this space. So that's kind of the first thing is that we get higher yields. When we dig a little bit deeper, and really one of the main reasons we chose the markets is, is this health concept that I was talking about earlier, is that we want the relationship between what we are going to charge our demographics and what they make to be in a healthy range. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Rent collection. But the, for us, the most important thing, and, and I would hope for the guy you're referencing earlier investing in LA, it's like the most important thing for real estate investors, especially value add real estate investors, in my opinion, is to pick markets that are healthy, where the constituents in that market aren't don't have low quality of qualities of life, and they aren't trying to vote in people into power that are promising rent reform. Because if rent reform or rent stabilizations or rent control come in, it's just going to cut 
the feed out of all the operators. And it's like, from my standpoint, we're trying to be stewards of capital, stewards of our LP money. Like, let's pick markets that are healthy, where people are happy with high quality of life and strong job growth, and not pick markets where people can't afford to pay rent. Because people that can't afford to pay rent don't always just move, right? People like to say they move, but in the reality is they vote the person in the neighborhood into power who promises, oh, I'll stop your rent from going up. So. For us, it's a very, very, very important uh, part of the equation, and and we started seeing this play out. You know, we've been screaming this from the rooftops for a long time, and now, like, okay, people are talking about rent reform in, in red states where you never thought anyone would ever be talking about it. So, well, I mean, uh, hold on a second. First off, um, we got to educate people as the uh, what Milton Friedman says is are the two ways to destroy a city. Do you know what they are? I'm going to say rent control and rent control is my guess. No, the second one was carpet bombing. There you go. <laughs> you get the first one right. Yeah. 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 And so, but the areas that you're looking at, okay, Indianapolis, you know, good red state, Columbus, Ohio, mm, that one, that one, you never know which way they're going to go. Pittsburgh, boy, that's, that's always been a, 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 a There's uh, swing states, but the, the constituents in the states aren't talking about, or there's, not swing states, right? But Allegheny is a, a swing district within the state. But the point is, is that the political narrative isn't about rent reform or rent control because everyone can afford their rents. Well, that, that's okay. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's okay. But, that's a good point. And also it's like, I, I wish it was as easy as picking red states, but like red states are going rent I stabilization, know, rent know. control. Yeah, so I, I think it's a you know responsibility for the real estate investor to, to dig one layer deeper and be like, can people pay rent? It's like, oh, I can scream and cry about maybe some type of party, red or blue, that is pushing forward a narrative of rent reform and I'm the victim. It's like, no, you stayed in this market, you invested in a market that has this, you know, and yeah. and we learned that the hard way investing in New York City. And so for us, you know, we were starting this strategy in New York, kind of like it sounds like they were doing in LA. And there are people doing roll up strategy in New York right now, very large groups for of these small multifamily. But for us, it's like, I don't, you know, it, it, shame on me. All the things that are amazing about Pittsburgh, Columbus, and Indianapolis are wrong in New York City. Right. You know, not strong, sticky job growth in healthcare and education, not um, affordable rents, not high quality of life, you know. So, okay. So, you are a, a it sounds as though you're a huge proponent for Joe Biden's uh, Renters' Bill of Rights, right? It's just like, how do you, well, I don't want to get into politics here. So, no, come you're, on. You're, it's you're, fun. Tipping, you're pushing me into uh, getting myself in trouble. I hope you can edit. Edit okay, let time. me let me bring you back to the the, the social scientist in you. Um, you mentioned before that uh, you know you and those the people at your dinner table were talking about uh, you know looking at places where the AMI uh, the twenty five percent of of the rent you know can be afforded uh, you know and that's how they look at it. What types of demographics do you look at in the Columbus, the Indianapolis, and the Pittsburghs? So we like to say this is a this is a good spot. One hundred percent. We like to be target 30% discount off of luxury rents. So, so we're buying, I like, I use the example in Pittsburgh, we own three properties in the South side, right down the block from Brookfield, one of the largest institutional real estate companies in America, just acquired a very large multifamily property right down, literally five blocks from us in the South side. So I like to be near the luxury multifamily downtown type properties, but we're like the small walk up brownstone down the road, but we renovate to the same finishes that Lennar renovates all their properties. Quartz countertops, white subway tile backsplashes, engineered hardwoods, you know, stainless steel appliances. You, you've got it figured out. You've got it all figured out. Your value, when you walk into a property, it looks like a terra. Exactly, that's it. It's property. just done. It's just yep. done, right? You have yep. pride in where you live, but you don't, you're not paying for the doorman. You're not paying for the gym. You're not paying for the on-site management. You're not paying for all these other things that take a building's operate expenses from 30% to 50%, for example, right. or, or right. mid forties, you know, depending right. on their tax reassessment. Excellent. Okay. Now, um, you're, you're, you've got a fund, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. looking to raise money for a fund. 
Second fund now, yeah. Second fund. What, what did you shut down the first fund at? Well, how much money did you make? We were $5 million in equity, friends and family. Okay. Oh, just friends and family. Okay, cool. Pittsburgh specific. Uh, we started raising it while we had full-time jobs to, to keep the lights on. And then yeah. once we, we raised it and were fully deployed and stabilized, we stabilized at a, I was looking at it today, 8.8 .8 yield on cost. 8.8 okay. .8 cap. All right, so let's see. Here's where I see your problem, and you tell me how it's not a problem. Sure. You take well, well, how big is your second fund? What are you going to try to raise? 25, 25 million. We're still raising five million to deploy in eight unit properties in secondary markets. You guys have to buy a lot of property sure. to hit that number. We buy okay. between 15 and 20 units a month. Oh, you do. That's where you're at now. 15 to 20 units a month. And let me tell you, okay, the really cool thing about that is you guys are probably the biggest swingers in that marketplace because you're walking in and you're buying cash. You could pay cash for 100%. these things. Yeah, yeah. We don't, as a rule, especially now, everything we do is financing contingent. Okay. Um, you know, if you had asked me that in 2020. One, I would have told you, yeah, of course we buy cash. Um, probably got a bridge loan before we close, but now everything is financially contingent. You period. do. Okay. Why are you that's it? just the nature of the capital markets. Like lenders that we've worked with for a long time are just skittish and, and they're just scared to execute. The people are. They're still closing. Oh, okay. It just takes an extra week, extra two weeks. Like people yeah. just move slower now. I think it's liquidity issue for upcoming refis. I think I think there's a lot going on that makes our lending partners not move as quickly as they used to. But for us, it doesn't matter because we have financing contingencies and we'll just close next week, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's really interesting. All right, so tell me about, um, well, you do two, two, two eight, give me those numbers again, how many per month you do? 15 to 20. Units? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And so at that rate, how, how long is it gonna take you to close out the $25 million? Two and a half years. Two and a half years, and at the twenty-five million dollars, what will be the uh, you know the street value of the property? What will be the asset value of the properties? And what's your LTV going to be at the twenty-five million? It will adjust, kind of depending on the capital markets, but we're goal seeking sixty-five percent LTV. Oh, that's good. That's very safe. That's very yeah. safe. Okay, so what's your strategy after the ren renovations? Are you buy and hold and? Uh, yeah, so we so the the perfect strategy is for us is you you buy and renovate along the way, right? So every time we have our contract signed with our contractors before we close, they start within the first week or two, you know, ramp up, et cetera. And we give them a lot of work so we, we can place them at different projects and stuff. And and that's a big, big that's like an essential thing for a value add real estate investor is having the carrot and the stick, having that future work opportunities for contractors, you know, and having the materials picked out, having guardrails on, but we can talk about that later. But um, so we, we buy and renovate along the way, call it two and a half years to get to each portfolio in each of our markets, approximately 150 units. Once these 150 unit portfolios are fully stabilized at, at year three, we have perfect cash flow for that year. We optimize our cash flow. We have audited financials. Every all tenants that we have have to pay online. Everything is, you know, trackable and, and there's no, oh, what was this expense? What was that expense? We have audited financials to then start interviewing brokers and strategically exit in year five. I love what you're doing. I love it. I it is the coolest thing. It is you're a big, big player in a small market. Hundred percent. I mean, I don't mean just a market. I mean the, the 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 geographical market. I mean just the eight unit to fifteen unit. Mm -hmm. That's. I mean, you're a big player in that size, and you can come in and and just control. You know how how the deals get done. Um, so. How big does your market have to be for you guys to go in there? We like we like MSA. So we think about it as MSAs. Um, it we're we're working through that and we're considering going to slightly smaller MSAs. But right now they're two million people plus. Um, and the reason for that is that it just you need enough 
housing stock. You need enough That's right. people coming in and out. You need a big enough yeah. renter base. You, you just need the inventory. Otherwise, we're bidding against ourselves. We'll buy everything yeah. in the first year. Right. So, so we have to be very careful in the markets that we go into. And we need markets that have a lot of this older housing stock and housing supply. So for us, that really is, you know, Pittsburgh stood out as number one. And then shortly after that was Columbus and Indianapolis. Okay. And once you get in there, how do you, how are you finding your deals? Are you going direct to the owners? Are you, are you, so uh... my, my business partner comes out of, um, finance, JP Morgan, private equity, and um, strategy consulting, specifically in acquisition strategies. So he kind of brought best in practice strategy or acquisition strategies to Terra Capital. And we have a very, very big data approach to our acquisition strategy. So at the front of the funnel is five or six publicly accessible data sources that we overlay to get the best information that we can get. You know, we hire skip tracers, we hire a lot of different all publicly accessible data to get the property information. Then it's kind of truncated down to our properties that we want to approach that meet certain criteria. What we're ideally looking for is someone that's owned the property for a longer time that doesn't own too many properties. And what we've seen in that case is those people don't really want to go sell their property with a broker because often they're a little embarrassed. They know they should renovate it, but they just kind of don't have the time Time. their main job isn't being a real estate investor, real estate professional. They, you know, I'm a chef at the restaurant or I own a restaurant and I own a few properties from, from my family, whatever the narrative is. Yeah. So we're, we're targeting those sellers and we're right now for our first fund, we were about 50% on market and off market as we kind of got the engine going. We, we were, I was looking at our last I don't know, trailing 12 deals, 15 deals we did, we're at 90% off market right now. And that's not like people say off market where there's a really a broker. Like there's, this is just, hey, John, I know you haven't renovated. I know you got vacancy, but we'll buy it. And John's like, oh, okay, great. Let's, I'll sell to you. Oh, just so you know, I have two more. Like if this one goes well with you guys, I'll sell those to you too. So we have a lot of repeat sellers as well. Okay. Uh, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm, I, I, when I read your website, I'm like, okay, this sounds kind of interesting. I like what these guys are doing. Now I am just, I love what you're doing. You're doing, I've been trying to teach this to people for years now. Like this is the market to be in. You can find golden opportunities. And, and I saw it with Aaron Merriman and now I'm seeing it with you, you know, in, in the secondary markets. This is the way you build up a portfolio and become multimillionaires and multifamily. This is how you do it. 100%. This is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I love it. I absolutely love it. So now, because um, I, I was, when I asked my last question, I was trying to compare it to, uh, you were, you know, we were talking about the MSAs. Um, I was thinking like Nashua, New Hampshire, but, you know, take Manchester, New Hampshire, maybe, yes. maybe, you know, yeah, it's just not the well, right well size for, for us, unfortunately. I, I do love that market purely from a user standpoint, not necessarily from an investor standpoint, yeah, but you, um, you, go, you have a place to go skiing. That's exactly. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah. But, you know, I, I wish Salt Lake City, Utah worked for this yeah. strategy, but it doesn't, you know. You gotta, exactly. Yeah, try to you sell gotta, it. You've got to separate quality of life from your own standpoint, from, you know, where you're investing in. Yeah, you know, it's the reality. So, all right. So let's bring it in for the, the landing here. What are you offering your investors when they come into your fund? Tell me how your fund is set up for your investors. Yeah. So I really wanted to provide a product for, and, and, and frankly, a part of the reason for this is that a lot of our investors come out of institutional real estate world as individuals. So I didn't want to like bring a offering to them that was like 50, 50 splits, 60, yeah. 40, like any of that. Right. I needed the stuff that they see all the time. And frankly, I want to build a big, strong company where people are proud to invest with us. And so we do as standard as we can with two and 20, 7.5% pref. Two and 20. So 2% asset management fee on deployed equity. Okay. And then a, 20% split to the general partner after the 7.5 pref is hit and all the money is returned. And it's, in my experience, as simple and as institutional as you can get. We could add a Lehman scale in there, but it would confuse everybody. And we're, we have a lot of 
high net worth investors and, and family offices. So we don't want to yeah. be like, oh, eight, once you hit 9%, it does this. Once you hit 13%, it does this. It's just hard for people to conceptualize. And our, and our goal is to grow our investor base and not confuse everybody. Okay. So what is your exit strategy with these properties? I heard you mention something about getting to like about 150 unit portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, is your plan to sell that to another investor as one lump sum portfolio? We, we like to think that by that point, we could be a buyer as a core fund, you know, have an, a, a value add fund and a core fund. But the reality is, is that we're, there's a lot of buyers for that 150 unit mark, syndicators, right. family offices, in, uh, international investors that want, that want a higher yield than the single 150 unit class a property in the heart of pittsburgh pennsylvania right even now that wouldn't trade above a five uh, which is crazy and i'm not saying i would want to buy that myself but that's that's what people do um so ultimately we'll hire cbre cushman wakefield someone like that we'll go out to the full market um and sell it as a portfolio okay all right so um any chance of you like refinancing out yeah we want to you know it's it's interesting you ask that like we get that question a lot we we would like to provide rollover opportunities maybe a recapitalization event and we'll we'll talk to our investor base when the exit period comes to see like what people want to do um but for from our standpoint you know to show returns to show proof of concept to show the thesis we kind of need to show an exit there needs to be an exit valuation that's done. And so if the offer is so good and everyone wants to double their money, then let's sell it. But if people want, are like, look, Tom, I don't have somewhere else to put my money. I'm like, well, I actually have fund four. We can do this, or we have a core fund. So we're going to be strategic about our exit, but you know, contractually in our fund documents, it's a five-year hold um, to exit. Interesting. Well, what's a minimum investment? You guys do. Uh, typical investors for us are 250,000. Um, but you know, the, my vision and the way I view it is like, I would rather add accredited investors and, and people that are interested in what we're doing at a smaller ticket. If that's something that limits them from investments, then not. But to date, pretty much all of our investors, I think, except for maybe one, what has been 250,000 or above. And just so everybody listening here can understand that, that's because um, that's because Tom grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and uh, and uh, most everyone he went to high school with are accredited investors, just from their you know just from their allowance, their weekly allowance from their parents. Um, so that's why you're hearing these big numbers. Uh, I got two more questions. I, I had already written down my last question, but I keep coming up with more more, more questions for you. Uh, how are you handling the property management? So we do all in-house. Um, I've only worked at real estate operators and developers that have done in-house management. Yep. So copying the best in class systems from them. So we hire based off of our unit need internally W2 employees that manage the properties. And then we contract with service companies to fix toilets and take trash out and do snow removal. Um, I Okay, so you've got three lo three markets that you're taking care of. Uh, like, how many units do you have in each each market? I would say, I, like, I don't market. know the numbers of that off the top of my head. Pittsburgh, we're getting close to a hundred. Columbus and Indianapolis are lagging behind okay. 30, 40 units in each of them at this point, um, just because our first fund was Pittsburgh. So we're just our engine is just better there at this point. Um, okay. But we're we're building them out in the other markets as well. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Now the um, final question is, I mean, what, one thing you talk about the website that I thought was pretty cool is, you know, how you're coming in and, and changing these neighborhoods. Yeah. And, you know, really, because, you know, as I was reading your website, I was thinking to myself, where, if he was in Boston, where would he do this? It's like, you know, what's going on in South Boston right now or, or you know, the South End uh, years ago? You know, you're looking at the Roxbury's, the Mattapans. I mean, that, that's you come in and start doing this because people, as you said on the website, people want to live there. And, you know, it's becoming those those places. So how, how you know, th what have you done in these neighborhoods so far? Yeah, so, you know, 
your listeners are from all over the U.S., so it's yeah. a little tricky to kind of paint a perfect picture for what that looks like. You know, if people know like a Williamsburg in Brooklyn, or if they know right. like the North Side in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Like, I don't, I don't know what in everyone's mind is like that up and coming kind of cool, trendy, low rise, historic neighborhood is. But that's where we're investing, and and really, I mean, majority of our properties have real vacancies, have have roofs that haven't been renovated in 40 years yeah and it's detrimental to the neighborhood so we're right. going in and often working hand in hand with the city especially if there's sometimes historical boards involved you know we're, we're used to that process we're used to that system and for us it's just as long as you solve for anderson or marvin windows at the beginning of your underwriting it's no surprise when you get the $1,200 quote, you know, for, per window halfway through your construction bidding process. So, so we're going into neighborhoods that need the, the individual units or properties need love. And we're providing that and we're trying to maintain the fabric of the neighborhood. We're not coming in and just blasting hardy paneling over every single property we buy. I, I have done that when it wasn't salvageable or if it met the fabric of the neighborhood. Right. But we're, we're trying to mold the best we can with the vibe and area of the city and, and people like us for that. So have you ever, um, and I just came up with another question. Have you ever heard of land banks? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're doing your searches there for properties and opportunities? No, we're, okay. we're not. Uh, we really are just laser focused on our engine and like yeah. not deviating from it because our deal flow is already there. But, you know, that's, that's just... That's just how, yeah. how it is. It, you know, the tricky thing is that we don't want to go too far down the, the spectrum on distress. And we don't want to be in neighborhoods where, you know, you, you, I think you may have coined this term. Or, um, it's like you're in the, the vicious cycle of death where it's like tenant moves in, they stop paying rent, you have to evict them. And then you just do it all over again. Yeah, so yeah. we're avoiding the cycle yeah. of death and heavy okay. distress. I have not said that. Okay. Oh, no, no. I have used the uh, chasm of death, uh, there you go. The, the Monty Python reference. Uh, you go. But, but in that particular case, what you're describing is why I have a bumper sticker on my car that said the car that says "Life is too short to own C-class property." Hundred percent. That is that. You got to avoid it, and it's so tempting, right? And like I, I talk about this too, like big value add projects, like 150 unit heavy value add where you need to get a new CO look amazing on paper, but they're so difficult to execute. I've done it. It's hard. It's hard. And, and, and you, then you add on top of that, that you're out of town, a thousand miles away. 100%. It's, it's terrible. I know I've learned but a two that. unit, a two unit that needs new engineered hardwoods and new backsplash and new quartz countertops and maybe reinforced like that's not difficult i can send a contractor in there for three weeks and they get it done and they get yeah and they're done and, and if, you, if they if they blow out the budget they're only going to blow it up by 20 percent, you know and you can handle yeah, that and then they know they got another 40 jobs with us so they don't want to blow it up too exactly, much. exactly so. exactly thomas oh man i think we're going to be talking again i love what you're doing i love it i'm so glad you were on my award-winning podcast <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're going to hear that a lot you're too easy i was i was excited for getting the uh the mean shark approach here. oh come on man no i'm no that's just when people bring me stupid things you got to bring the heat i was oh, no. you, listen i love i honestly what you're i'm, I'm going to take this podcast and unedited send it out to all my cl my clients and students say this guy is doing what all of you should be doing well wow. i told i told my wife i was ready for war this morning so <laughs> you went to oh sure you want to get my irish up I, I'll, we'll I, know, I, i'm ahead. irish too I, I came prepared oh I, no but the thing <laughs> is remember what you know you're a new yorker i'm a bostonian yeah and i tell you that the, you and i talk the uh, same language 100 we say bless your heart in a different way than the rest of the country. And, and we're still friends after we say it to each other. So, there you go. Yep. Thomas, thank you so much. It was a blast. Was I, awesome. I love what you're doing. Terra, usaterra.com, folks. Uh, check it out, Terra Capital. Um, we're going to be hearing more from this guy. It's going to be awesome. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Awesome. Have a great Take one. Care.